All right. So uh, basically, uh, the, the three major mediums is watercolor, uh, acrylic, which is water-based, and, um, and oil painting, which I've always used for like 70 years on painting. I'm getting that old, uh, maybe more than 70 years now. But uh, the last 20 years, I've been down in Florida. We moved from New York down here. And I've been teaching at Old School Square probably since 2003 or 2004. And it's a sad thing now that they're not really operating right now. We're trying to wait to see what's going to happen there with Old School. Uh, it's, it would really be a loss if that doesn't pick up on its art programs and, uh, and what have you. Well, anyway, I'm teaching at the Boca Museum Art School and the Lighthouse Art Center. And last year I was teaching at the Armory, but not this year. And I'm only teaching a la prima. I stopped teaching drawing and all the other things because a la prima really means let's start sketching it out, get an outline, don't overdraw your subject, and then start the painting. So I'm going to now show you what Ralph looked like in when, he, when I was 21, just out of service. And you can see some of my very stiff paintings behind me at that age where I was painting from like 16 and on, you know, seriously. And then I'll show you me, Stan Dornfest knows where this studio is in Delray Beach, which is now a bed and breakfast. And I had to move out of that. But you see that stained glass window that's behind me? That's Conrad Pakel, and that's probably worth more than the studio is, but it's a palette and it, it was just a beautiful studio. Um, a la prima, we draw and paint all at once. Uh, I'll give you a little bit on the class outline that I use. Instructor and participants create new artworks from an image or a live model or what at each session. And if we don't finish it in class, I urge them to finish it at home and then we can take a look at it early in the next class. Uh, the subject for paintings varies between, you know, whether it's seascapes, landscapes, still lifes, figures, portrait studies, it doesn't really matter what it is. If you learn to see accurately and learn how you can make your image look like what you're seeing where you have control of your mediums, it really doesn't matter whether it's a still life figure or what have you. It's, that's all in the brain that makes one harder than the other. And that's my feelings on it. Uh, it probably does, many people don't believe that. They'll say, well, portraits are hard or what have you, because people are more questionable of whether it looks like someone or not. As an instructor, I demonstrate during the drawing phase and the painting stage. So I demonstrate how I would go about using the model and, and working up the sketch. And I don't do more than a sketch. I don't overdraw it because we're only going to paint right over it. Participants are encouraged to use a minimum palette and gain proficiency in color mixing. So I'll cover it a couple of times that I'm pretty much just using the primary colors and a titanium white and the medium. The water, if it's with acrylic, it'll be a water based medium. Uh, if it was oil painting, I'd be using either turpentine or turpentine and thinning it out. My first layers, when I start the painting, will be very thin, all right? So I'll try to do finish the painting in no more than three layers. The first layer will be covering that whole canvas from the back coming forward. The focus on, and this is something probably in the last five years, it came to me as a brainstorm that to three things that they need to learn. Number one, learning, understanding, and becoming proficient in color. And I'm talking about understanding the color wheel, how it works, how complements work, how adjacent colors work. And by using a minimum palette, we learn to mix just with the primaries. If we use yellow, red, and blue, we can almost make I say 80 to 85% of all the colors in the palette. We would need a few special colors to maybe hit some things like uh, turquoise or uh, some other colors that we see that are a little tricky. The other thing besides color is understanding perspective. 
if we can see accurately, we don't have to understand it. If we can see accurately and judge the angles and judge how large something is compared to something else, we can almost copy what's in front of us and never have to understand perspective. The only reason to understand perspective is if we leave that scene where we can no longer see it and we want to add to it, we got to understand perspective so that we can put new things in or move things so that it still looks like it's right. Uh, the last category is a very big category and I call it anatomy. Where we normally think of anatomy like on uh, figures of uh, models of the human, uh, the human being, we go to figure study classes and those are excellent. And the more you, you uh, draw a figure, the more you learn how the figure works, where the joints are, how they turn. But I include in anatomy not only human beings, but dogs, cats, birds, fish. Uh, and I'll also include anatomy of inanimate things like doors, windows, stools, chairs, uh, tables, uh, houses, cars, trucks. So, you know, that's an endless thing of how does objects work? So that after a while, when you've drawn them enough, you can draw them without looking at them. So I can draw a fire hydrant because I've drawn enough fire hydrants. I can draw a truck and understand how a truck looks from the back, the front, the top, the bottom, so that I can draw a truck in any angle. This comes with practice. It's not something we learn overnight, but the constant practice, particularly with drawing, because drawing simplifies things in a black and white sketch where you can retain it in your mind very clearly and call it back. Most of our learning skills are in the drawing. And that's why I think a lot of artists that I talk to and including myself emphasize that 90% of being an artist is being able to draw whatever it is. The painting you get good at, and much of it is by experiencing of how to mix your colors, how to put them down, where you're working from. So I just wanted to cover that in the beginning. And I know uh, Adrienne will be taking anybody's questions and she'll put them on a list. And if she thinks them sort of timely, she'll interject me and, and uh, I can answer a question. But you'll probably see many of the questions answered as we go through the presentation. Thank you, Ralph. Yeah. I want to answer, ask a question, put, them in, put it in the chat. Uh, this slide is pretty much what I just spoke about. Color, understanding how color works, proficiency in mixing and matching. And you know, it's, it's one of those things there, if you have the color wheel and you just have the primaries and the white, you're forced to mix it, you know, so you'll, and I always say, don't contaminate the pool of color that you put from the tube on your palette. Work from the edges on it to add one to the other. So you don't have to keep on replenishing your colors. Uh, one of the things I've always noticed, and I used to have my, my wall, I cut a, a box there where I had like 20 colors on it. And if you have 20 colors to choose from, it complicates everything, uh, not only in the names of colors, but how they work and all the differences. So I find that the Alla Prima method and simplifying your palette, you get to point where color becomes second nature to you as to when you look at a color, that you want to match, you compare what you have so far and what you want to match. And you say to yourself, gee, I either need more red in it or more blue or more yellow, or maybe a little white to tone it down to uh, cut down on the hue. The primary colors and white really makes you better over time at mixing. Uh, perspective, understanding how it works, proficiency in applying perspective. When you Good at perspective, you'll know it like if you're sitting in a room and you can copy the scene that's in front of you pretty good, but then without moving, you can imagine yourself 10 feet to the left and seeing what would change in your scene without moving. So that's when you know you understand perspective where you can change the lines without moving. You'll notice where your horizon line either dropped down to or raised up if you stood up and you'll notice where your vanishing points change on lines. Uh, the anatomy again includes more than the, the human figure and you gain proficiency by keeping on practicing drawing those things. Draw your chair, draw your stool, draw 
your hand, uh, draw uh, a doorway. Uh, here's that color wheel. And uh, I know those of you who are in, many of you in the watercolors here are really proficient at it, you know, and so I don't want to just reiterate any things, but I just do, I don't like using the names that are on the tubes anymore because different manufacturers have different names for things and it just makes it more difficult for you. So I try to put, you know, again, the primary names and then I look at a color to say, gee, do I need to warm it up or cool it down? And, and if you look at this color wheel, the ones that are on the right side of the color wheel are cool. And we call them cool because if you think of a nighttime, you'll see that, you know, that from the purples right on to some of the uh, yellow greens are cool, where the ones on the left side of the color wheel are warm or hot. So your yellows and your oranges and reds are very warm. And then you start to get into like the crimsons, they cool down, and then you get into the purples. So it's a real big help on that color. Uh, I won't cover this right now, but just briefly, I just want to tell you that these are the colors that I will be using today in my demo. And again, uh, I'll use a warm and a cool of each of the primaries. So a warm and a cool yellow, a warm and a cool red, a warm and a cool uh, blue. And, uh, if you look at the colors on the tubes, you open them up and put them on your palette, you can see in that image that's sh showing you the rainbow, you know, which is a light going through a prism, you can see the ultramarine blue all the way on the left, and then you can see almost a cobalt blue, which is a warmer blue. And then you got a, like a, a, a cerulean blue that's very light. And then you go into greens, yellows, oranges, and reds. Color wheel and the, the light of color really are close, closely matched. Uh, other things that I use in the class, I use the acrylic paint, but you just as easily use oil or watercolor, but I like acrylic because we can work faster in a two hour time frame. So if it dries, we can overpaint over it. You know, with watercolor, you're gonna have to scrape something off if you put it in the wrong place. So it's not as flexible. With oil, uh, you have to sometimes wait for it to get tacky before you can mix uh, certain ways. So the acrylic works really good with Alla Prima demonstrations. Uh, I use water-based media uh, period, usually 110 gram, uh, pound weight paper, which is thick enough where it won't crinkle. And sometimes I'll gesso that paper so it's uh, got a little bit of a texture to it and it's not uh, porous at all. So you can paint on the paper. You can do a finished painting on that and just mat it and frame it and they look terrific. And you can sell them for less than what you sell things on canvas. Uh, I'll use the disposable pie, pie plates to mix my colors. In fact, uh, let me see if I can show it. Well, I'll show you that once I start the painting. But I'll put my uh, tube colors on the edge, and I'll use the most of the big 10-inch pie plate to mix the colors on. And then I can throw it away after the session. Okay. Uh, I'll use a piece of willow charcoal to do my drawing. All right, and I find willow charcoal very good because you can erase it with your hands or a towel and it keeps you from getting fussy. Uh, pencil, you can't see all the time and pencil's harder to erase than the willow charcoal. Oh, isn't that rainbow terrific? <laughs> I happen to see that on my wall in my house when it was cutting through a prism. Uh, this is my, uh, <laughs> there's the pie plate. I use one water to clean the brushes and the other water to keep it clean, which I'll mix with the acrylic paint as my thinner. And then here's uh, some of the colors, a warm and a cool yellow, a warm and a cool red, and a warm and a cool blue. Uh, for those who are, want to paint along with me, I'm using a, a lemon yellow or a yellow light, uh, which is the, the light, very bright yellow. And then you got a, a yellow medium, a red, that's a medium. And then I used also an alizarin crimson, which is, you know, getting is a, a cool red. The cobalt blue I'll use as a, a warm blue and the ultramarine blue will be a cool blue. Now, a lot of times you can just pick one of each of these colors and do your painting, which will simplify it even more. I find that it's more important 
to match the values, then match the color exactly. Don't forget, if you're painting outdoors, the light's changing during the day, so your color hues are changing as the, the sun goes from different parts of the, on the sky. You'll notice here on uh, brushes, I'll usually paint the whole painting in two or three, four brushes at the most. I try not to overdrive it with things. The only thing I don't have in that picture is the charcoal. Uh, oh, this is a charcoal drawing on the subway in New York. So, <laughs> But this drawing has a little bit in perspective here. So that's a learning value. Uh, this is a photograph at the Art Students League where I had gone a few years nights uh, to, to, to learn from models. And, um, and then I took a panorama of this scene uh, in the cafeteria of the Art Students League. So up on the top floor, this is what it looks like up there. But you'll notice as you go to a panorama how the, um, the walls bend. So if you're going out more than like a, a 90 degree or 100 degree angle, beyond that, you start getting distortion. So I usually say to keep your view, if you can put your hands out in front of you from where you're facing, and form a right triangle with both your arms. That's where you pretty much want to keep your view to, to avoid distortion of the angles on perspective. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of... Uh, life, life drawing is a, a wonderful place to really learn how to draw and, and understand the figure. Uh, whether you're drawing something with a, a model and a stool, um, Outdoors, for an outdoor scene that was up in the Hudson Valley uh, by Lake Mayapak. And that was my starting sketch, keeping it simple. And then the painting wound up, I just used the watercolor base, just filling in some things. So like in an hour, an hour and 20 minutes, I got a sketch of uh, a thing that I could use back in my studio as a, as a study to do a painting, an oil painting from. Uh, some useful tips. This is an important one because particularly people new to uh, uh, studying art or studying painting, there's a tendency to believe that the model is the Bible and the success of them is to make it exactly like the model. In the beginning, that's an important thing to see if you can match and, and, and match it up and, and check it out. But keep in mind in your drawing, Try and make sure that you just don't copy what's in front of you. Look to see how you can make your scene better. And sometimes that's moving around in the studio if you're working with a model. Move around the studio. Don't lock up where there's a dedicated easel for you to work from that you're not getting a, a, a good view of what you want. So the model is a model. It's not the Bible. The objective should be that your finished work is better than the model. Oh, let's go on to the next one. Another tip, critique your own work, all right? And be your best critic. And that's sometimes hard to do. Your finished painting should be better than the model, not that it's a necessarily a match. When I do my painting and I look to see what I got and then what it looks like on a model, I usually ask my question, if I see it's different, Every time I'll say, well, which one do I like? Do I like what's in front of my eyes uh, uh, as the model? Or do I like what I just did? And, and maybe I'll keep that. But the, the, the training is in you recognizing there's a difference. In the very beginning, we often don't recognize that it's different than what we're seeing. If any of you saw uh, the movie on cable television called My Brilliant Friend, uh, which took place in Naples, Italy. I was just mesmerized with that storyline about two young women in, in Italy after World War II, post-World War II. And um, they were really versed into literature and writing. In art, when I critique a work or I judge a show, I look at a paintings, the paintings, I say, what, what can I take out of this painting that would make it look better? All right. So my first suggestion is to look at the painting and see, is there anything I can take out that would make it look better? I don't find anything or I did that and it still needs something. My second 
alternative would be, what can I move that will make it look better? And it could even be you moving yourself to a different angle. Last resort is to make your painting more complicated is what do I have to add to make it look better? And in our demo today, I'm gonna to be adding something to make it look better. So I'll show you that. What, what I mentioned that movie about was this one young girl who sort of helped the other girl go to the university and she was brilliant. She was asked to help her friend with her thesis. So she started to help looking at the thesis. And the first thing that she did, she says, let's eliminate this paragraph. And then the second uh, thing that she said, let's move this sentence or this paragraph to here. And the last thing she said, let's add this. And I watched that and because I thought I was the inventor of this uh, method, you know. And when I saw that, I said, oh my God, this is common sense. Everybody else must have known this and whether it's literature or whether it's art. The three best things you can look at is how you can simplify will be your best alternative. Your second best is what can you move? So if you had a tree that was covering the doorway of a house, move the tree, you know. If you had a, a person that's standing to the edge of your painting, move the person in or take them out. Your last resort would be, let me add a person because I have this empty void of a space. What do I need to do to fill it in? So it works in literature, in writing, as well as in art. It's, uh, I guess, a philosophy in life. I'm not going to cover any more. Any more tips I give you, I'll give you during the demo. Um, Oh, you can hear the train. <laughs> and, that, and that's a Barely, place. Barely, Ralph. It's not a problem. I just want to show you a couple of samples of the Alla Prima that I, I don't know if you can see this. Yes, that, that's good. Hold it close like that. Let me get the glare off it. All right. This was just a still life demo of just pears and a vase. And it's from another artist that was in Fine Art Connoisseur. And again, we used the uh, a photograph of the, of the painting and then we just made it a little different, you know? And one of the things that I did was I eliminated some things, but I also moved the, the pair was covering the corner of the vase, which was a key uh, piece there. So I moved it in a little bit to give it a little more emphasis. I also, changed the setting so I got more of the tablecloth in the color at the bottom rather than have it cut off here. And I, I took these orchids where they were normally coming down like this. I also put one up going up so it changed the angle like that. Uh, another one that we recently did was a couple of spoon bills. I don't know, you're probably getting a lot of glare on that. Uh, that's okay. No, it's this, okay. This was a friend of mine who's a photographer. She had these two spoon bills that she never got published. She, she said, well, use that as one of the models for your, your class on painting. And she, you know, and one of the things that she had that I changed, she had a, a very um, saturated blue sky, a very blue, which really showed the, uh, the pink spoon bills very well. But I wanted to put the sun behind them and sort of silhouette them a little bit with the tree. So again, you use the, the model, whether it was a, an image or whether it's a live model, just as a model and try to make yours more tuned to what you're looking for. I just want to show you a, a couple of watercolors of mine because I, I used to, I love watercolor. Okay. This is Central Park. Oh, here we go. Yeah, that's better. And this was the day, uh, the first warm day after 911. And uh, you see, like, my painting style in watercolor is, um, you know, not the conventional thing. It's more of a sketch, you know. And I'll, I'll show you one other, too, that I did the same day. I was in the, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There was a Jackson Pollock up in one of the rooms and I had my sketch and my little watercolor, which just pretty much had like maybe eight, six or eight colors in it. And I had two people were sitting down in the room and I just did a quick sketch, mainly to capture perspective and a little bit of color. So this was a, a modern art room and what have you. 
but I painted here and then I went outside and painted in Central Park and I had painted another one. I painted three paintings that day. It was uh, just like revitalize, revitalization after the 911 horrific situation. When I go out to Montauk Point, these were my watercolors in Montauk Point. And you see, it's more of a watercolor sketch than anything else, you know, just to get this, the semblance of the day. Okay. Uh, this was a photograph that I took at Murakami. And we used that as a, an image for the, one of the classes. And just painting that tree looking up at the branches was one of the things. Can you see me, uh, Adrian? Yes, I have you. I just okay. have to reverse. Okay. Okay, okay. yeah. I'm gonna unplug it. Now I'm gonna have to turn around so you can hear me on the other microphone, but can you see, uh, let me see if I can turn it this way. Okay. It looks like Tuscany now. Oh. Okay, you had it for a moment. Oh, okay. Let me see. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Um, can everybody see the uh, image that's... Uh, we oh, can see it, but it's not moving. Yes, I can see it. Oh, oh wait a minute. I see what it is. Yeah, okay. We can see it. okay, now I see it. All right. So that's a, a painting that we've used from Tuscany, from a, a photograph that I used. Uh, this is one a la prima painting that we used in class that uh, was another study, more of a little landscape with a house. Uh, this is one we're going to use today. All right. This is, I painted this yesterday. And it's a beach scene from a photograph that I took up in Jupiter. And uh, I'll share that with you when I start my painting. I just want to show you some samples of Alla Prima. All of these are roughly 20 minutes, no longer than that. So between the sketch and the painting. And here's one with some anatomy. And this is from a still frame of a video I took at Green Cay uh, of some ducks swimming in uh, the pond there. And I, still, I stopped the video and just printed one image from the video of the, of the ducks. And we use that as a model for um, this, this painting, you know? And again, it's not the idea is to try and do a finished painting that's like um, very stiff and, and, and overworked. It's more or less to get the essence of all. The class has three hours to work. This is my demo, which is maybe altogether, maybe a half hour or 35 minutes uh, at the most. All right, this is from an artist that was grew up in Wyoming and he lived in Boynton Beach. This painting actually sits in the Boynton Beach Library in downtown Boynton. And I loved it. I thought this would be a great demonstration of Alla Prima method uh, on just a, a morning fisherman out there on the Atlantic Ocean capturing. Again, they're very quick. This is actually from a painting that I did in Montauk Point, you know, which is at the base of the lighthouse. I play on some purple values and a, and a yellow sky, which are complement colors. And it just makes a very soothing, uh, not too overworked. Oh, this is my demo of that tree, all right, that we saw in the photograph that I took at Morikami. And you know, when you look at the class, like if you have eight or 10 people all doing this tree, what's really interesting is to see the different versions because we allow them latitude to make it their own. Some will make it a vertical painting, some will make it a horizontal, some will make it with a different foliage around. Here's another one, uh, an Alla Prima demo uh, for the class. And it's very much Everglades. Here's one that would be, you know, if anybody's planning to paint in uh, Italy or France, you know, it's kind of a nice thing. You get into people, 
you know, here again, you know, you, understanding the anatomy of a person using a live model or using a, an image of someone. Uh, I'm going to show you one thing. Uh, let's see if I can walk this around a little bit. Can you see the Tuscan horse? Well, this is another good study in anatomy. Horses, and we go out to Sunshine Meadows in West Delray, and we try to paint horses or draw horses as much as possible so we get good at the anatomy. They're just a beautiful animal, I think. Whistler. Oh my God, can you, is, is that glare or? I used the Whistler's painting of a woman in white uh, to try and see how close we can get to her expression, and then just try to uh, give it a, a different sitting. You know, here, instead of her holding a fern or a, a leaf, I think she had in her hand, we put a red flower in there to sort of match her lips. Again, we can do anatomy, still lives, landscapes, what have you. Okay. You see the photo? I'm going to bring it up a little closer. So that you can see more. Now, this photo, the shoreline at Jupiter, uh, every year we have a week long painting event, uh, painting at uh, the Lighthouse Art Center, the Plain Air Festival. We have artists that come in from all across the country, some of the top artists that are Plain Air painters, and we go out and paint there. So, this will be the ninth year that's coming up in March. This was last year, and I went to Jupiter Beach and just took some reference pictures while I was painting. But again, if we're going to use this as the model, and I want to use, let's use, let's say this is my paper. Okay. Well, I'm not using the whole bed, but I'll. So, this is my canvas, but I'm also leaving a little room on the top sides and the bottom that in case I need it, I can just erase these lines and expand out another inch or two top, bottom and sides. But I want to make a painting of that shoreline. I don't like all of this. These two people, the two figures, a mother and a son here. They're right near the edge. So that was one of the things that say, well, uh, I might want to move them in a little bit. These ones that are down on this edge, I might want to take them out. They're so far by the edge, you know? There's, I don't think there's anything more degrading to a painting is when somebody looks at something and they, they put, they paint it just like this. They'll paint those people right over here because that's a dead giveaway that you're working from something that you, sh you could have easily moved and made it better. But in the beginning, we're usually all nervous that I don't trust myself that I can move it and get it right. So I need it to be exactly like what I'm seeing. But as you get more and more proficient, you move these things around without batting an eye. So if you're judging a show and you start to see something like this on the ends and painted in there, it's generally because the artist wasn't sure how to move them, you know? So the first thing I'll do in my sketch is decide where I want my horizon line, all right? Because that's going to determine, do I have more sky or do I under the sky or under the uh, ocean level? If I have a little sketch like thumbnail sketches, and I'm just going to just sketch two, you don't want to put the horizon line right in the middle because there's a tendency that it makes it too uniform, you know? So you either want to put it up at the top here, and then here's your ocean level like that, or you want to put it down below the midpoint and have it here. And you make the call, and the base, what you base the call on is, gee, does it, do I have more interest in the sky? Do I have beautiful clouds that I want to include in my painting? Because if you did, you'd pick this one, you know, and you'd have the clouds here. If you had more interest in the people on the shoreline and the surf hitting here, 
you probably keep your, your sky less, maybe in the top third. Uh, again, these things should go into your mind while you're figuring your sketch, because it's hard to make the change once you start to make the painting. So for me, on this one, let's put this the, the horizon line up there. But is that train again? My God. <laughs> on the horizon line, I know all of you know it, but I want to reiterate it. It's the same as eye level. The viewer's eye level, or if it was a photograph, it's the camera eye level, is synonymous with horizon line. By the ocean, it's clear that the ocean level is your eye level. So when I'm looking, when I took this photograph, my eye level, if I was here and I sketched myself in, that would be my eye level right there. And if I put myself in here, that would be my eye level. And I'll, I'm standing up higher on the ground than they are at the shoreline. That's why their heads are not up at the horizon line. If it was level ground, everybody in this picture, they would be roughly near the horizon line of the image. So, here I got my horizon line, and I'm going to mimic this line here. Uh, but you'll also notice the horizon line and the shoreline. If I continue that shoreline, over here is the vanishing point for this ocean level and the horizon line. So my vanishing point is off the picture, all right? And that's very possible in, your, in most of your paintings. Your vanishing point for the scene could be outside your canvas or inside the canvas. Uh, let's, uh, let's change it a little bit and let's put that vanishing point inside the canvas. So I'm gonna leave a little room here and I'm uh, almost gonna mimic that angle of the water. But now my vanishing point is right here. I'm just gonna say, here, it's here. So I made one change already. Uh, the surf on the water is not a straight line like I have. It's more random. But if you average out, you know, some of those rough things, it's more of how the water would form here. I have another, you see this reflection that's in the water, which is right after the surf? It's the previous wave that sank into the sand. And that usually reflects the color of the sky, all right? And here you see it, I don't know if it shows up on the camera, but it's a sort of a pale purple, which is almost the color of the sky here. So I'm gonna just put a little outline here and it sort of also forms and goes to that vanishing point, all right? Oops. If you think of the waves, when you look at them, they're usually by some seismic thing or the wind, it makes them repeat like maybe every 20 or 30 feet apart. So every wave is say 20 or 30 feet apart. But because you're closer to the waves that are by the shore, you're gonna have them bigger here. And then they get like this. And again, you're using that same vanishing point because over the long distance, they taper out. Now the distance between the next wave is shorter. And then again, you're starting to get that perspective by things that are the same size that are further away appear smaller. Okay, so now I've got a little bit of the ocean and usually I'll have one, one or two more, you know. After that, they start, they're so far away, you don't really see the breaks in them. Okay. These people now, her head is below, and I'm going to move her in. Oh, you've all heard the, the rule of thirds, you know, which somehow plays well on how we, um, a human being looks at things. Uh, if we've divided this canvas up into three this way, let's say one, two, three, that way, 
and three this way, so it's nine boxes now. Usually these intersections are things that you would put a um, something interesting in because your eye looks for them. So I just wanted to just mention the rule of thirds. In this one, I don't think it really applies too much because I'm going to put this figure over here, this one, 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 one. And I'll usually start with her head, shoulders, and I'm going to mimic just the angle that she's standing on, standing at. Have a dress coming down to there, like that. Now, her leg here. This left leg is what she's balancing herself on. So you usually find that that lines up right under her neck if she's comfortable and balanced. So like right over there, her heel will be somewhere over here like this. And the other foot on her is coming out here and it's sort of balanced. But let's just use that as a some model. Her hand is coming down here and she's holding the child's hand right there. And I'm gonna put the child in next to her. Here. Right now, and they're going to be silhouetted. In fact, I want to show you on the one that I completed. Look how um, simple they are. There's no detail in there, you know. Uh, and I I used a, a yellow sky, and you'll see that yellow reflection in the in the water that just sank into the sand. And then I use the pink sand on the beach with some footsteps in there. I changed the spacing of the people to make it more interesting, you know, more random. So let's see. We're gonna look how far apart these two are here. So I'm gonna put these people down here. Now I'm gonna have them on the sand, you know, down the, you know here and just sketch just a couple of figures there on that spot. Then I'm going to have these people I want to put around here. Their heads are higher than her head because they're a little further away down the beach. And I'm just going to again almost make them just very, very brief. We have a child next to this person here. And then I have a person kneeling on the beach somewhere over here. And I'm going to put that. This person, if I put them parallel to here, up on the high ground, I can have them something like this, kneeling down on the beach. Legs like that. It may be holding a fishing rod, you know, going out there. So, perspective wise, people that are closer to us appear bigger, bigger than smaller, smaller. You remember in the beginning, I said, What can I take out? Well, I took out that person that's a half a person on the edge. No need to put them in there. Can you imagine if I put them in there? Uh, it is be uh, not really any good, and it's just a, uh, a crutch that it was there, so I put it in there. Uh, what I want to do is I moved some people, I took something out. The last resort is well, maybe I got too much space here. Let me see if I can put in another person that's up on the beach, and let me put that person in. Let me see where I have them here. I have them a little lower than me, so they're just down on the sand a little more. So I'm going to put a person, let's say here, higher than them. Now I usually start off with the head, just an oval to get an idea. Here the neck, the shoulders, hips. And you can make it a male or a female, depending on you know, the anatomy you use. And I'm just going to put short 
legs that she's got some kind of a gown on, you know, and I'm going to have her facing. Let me just bring her up like this. And have her like this. Let's just have her. So that she's holding her arms there. Another good thing, too, is I want to add in here, maybe we have the it's fun here because I want to employ some shadows of the people rather than have just a, a, a solid white sky. I might want to put the sun here and reflecting some shadows of these figures here. And again, I'm using that as a source. So that might be my composition. I won't do any more detail. Now I'll go into the painting. Adrian, how are we doing on time? We're good. Okay. You have a good half an hour. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. Uh, I want to prove to you that I'm just using the primary colors. You know, so I got the. I only have one yellow, which is a lemon yellow, uh, cadmium yellow light. Oh, wait, yeah. why am I having yeah. trouble? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for you. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> There we go. There we go. That's it. So I have a titanium white, cadmium yellow light, a cadmium red light, which almost looks uh, borders on the orange, and then I've got a cadmium red medium, which is getting near uh, a crimson. I've got a, a, a cobalt blue and an ultramarine blue. Okay, no black, no brown, no umbers. I can make almost all those colors with these colors. In fact. You know what's interesting is that if you start to use the black and white, try never to use it all by itself. I know in watercolor, we generally use the paper as the white, you know, because you don't ever want to use that milky white that they give you in the box because it looks just like milk of magnesia on it and, and it sort of mutes your colors a little bit. So you, you thin your paints down with water so you don't lose the hue in it. But by adding white to the color, you cut down on the hue on it. The brushes that I use, whoop, there we go. I like to use flat brushes, you know, because I can use the narrow edge of it or the wide edge to cover this ground. And then I have a rule. I try to use as big a brush as I can fit into the space so I don't have to make as many strokes. Uh, I'll also start the painting from the back and come forward. So like on this one that I did uh, yesterday, I started from the furthest back, which was the yellow sky. And I, my main emphasis is I do one thin coat on everything and usually get one coat on there. This is like one and a half coats. It's pretty much the first coat of the paint with a, just a couple of touch ups in the waves. Um, then I worked the next thing down would be the sea. And then the next thing I did was the sand. And then the figures were last. I added them in and pretty much just silhouetted them on the first layer. And I put in the shadows, figuring I wanted to make this the lightest part of the sun over here, which is a little different than the one we're using today. But you see how the shadows, I have them going this way, this way, that way, almost like it's a spotlight on the sun which is not always the case, but if you have a very bright sun, you'll get, you'll, you'll get some of that, but it's coming in like a, almost like a single source. I have two things of water here, so I'm gonna just take this brush with some of that yellow. Um, oh. Adrian, you might wanna just keep me honest here. So every once in a while you can, I wanna show you what the palette looks like. Okay. So um, I wish I had another camera. Oh, yeah, well, it's a shame uh -huh. that the uh, iPhone isn't working. I'll move it up here so yeah, you can, we can see it. what you're doing. Before I start to paint, I'm going to look to see what kind of charcoal I can take off so I don't make it too muddy. So I'm going to take off the edges of the paper here. Can There's you some... uh, just say the name of this charcoal again, please? Because someone was asking. Oh, no charcoal. Uh, Say it again. Willow. Willow. Okay. Yeah, like a willow twig. And it's actually made from superheated willow twigs. And Jerry's Autorama sells it 
in a uh, something like this, you know, and inside there, oh, I don't have much left, but there's usually about 20 or 30 sticks in there of different uh, thickness. And it's a good way to keep them. And um, if you look at the, what the piece of charcoal looks like, it just looks like uh, just a stick. Mm -hmm. uh, they're usually about five, four or five inches long. I break them in half so I can work with the willow charcoal in a manageable. But again, I'm, I'm just cutting down on the amount of charcoal in my scene. Now that I know I can still see it, but this way it doesn't mix with the paint and make the paint, you know, dirty, you know? So take off any unnecessary charcoal that you don't need in a painting to help. Okay, now I'm gonna start putting some, whoa, watch for drips. <laughs> See how that charcoal gets muddy in there? But the beautiful thing about acrylic, when that dries, you can go over it in the next coat and you'll get rid of any of that. So I'm going right down into the sea level with that yellow sky. And then I'm gonna just grab another brush that's a, a little smaller. And I'm gonna add some white to the yellow. And I wanna put that sun it's right around here, a little brighter. And I want to sort of emulate it out a little bit so that it's radiating. If you've um, followed my plain air paintings, you'll see some crazy skies and what have you. I sort of make uh, my skies emulate what's going on on the ground, not only in shape, but in color. So if there's some things down here that are interesting. I'll sort of repeat the patterns in the sky where I can, rather than have just a pure blue sky on a clear day. I'll try and, in fact, uh, I might have an example of that. Oh, yeah, I, I, I would normally move that one, but if the light is on it, you know, if I know if I move that light, <laughs> we're going to be in trouble. But generally, you might look at my skies that have red, blue, yellow, uh, purple in it, and what have you. And it's like sometimes angular strokes or sometimes it's you know blended more uh, interesting but you'll, you'll find if you look at my paintings on my website at papagallery.com or ralphpapa.com you'll see some uh, interesting things that i've sort of um, um, wound up doing uh, over the years okay i'm not too worried that the color is going down into the sea right here now just clean off the brush come back to the paint and then i want to go i want to add a little red into my yellow where i get a little bit of an orange effect here and i want while that's still wet i'm going to just put just a little bit of color in here on the outside because i want it to be away from the sun where you know i might have some and you'll notice the brush strokes are more random. They're not just horizontal going across, you know. So that's my first layer of, uh, sometimes you get a little blue as you go up higher from the yellow uh, morning sky. Uh, I don't have that much room here, but if I was going up with a, a white sky, I would get that, when that yellow's turning into a sort of a pale blue. And eventually, if it's going right over my head, it would be a very pure blue that's up over my head or behind me. The water is next. So I'm taking some ultramarine blue, put some white, cutting it down on intensity, adding water to it. And if you look at the ocean, pretty much most any time of the day, except for sunrise and sunset, you'll notice that the horizon line on the water is usually a darker blue than anywhere else in the water. So I'm going to come across here and just sort of emulate my horizon line going across the ocean. And this area. Just bring that across. And I want it to 
not be a sharp line. I don't want it to be sharp where your eye goes right to that. I want it to be a very soft edge. I'm going to make it a little more blue. So this is a stronger blue at this point. One other thing while I'm doing this, a lot of times people will put the brush down six times over here, just making six strokes. I find it easier just to put the brush down, put pressure on it and drag your arm so that you get a nice steady line like that as you go across. You got much more control over the brush. Now, where I wanted that soft to be a soft line, I'll just take a paper towel, take the paint off the brush, and if it wasn't, if it was too hard an edge right now, I'm just going to put the brush lightly over that and just drag it so I have a very soft horizon line between the sky and the water. If you have a hard line there, if it's a scene, you go right to the horizon line as your first place to look, you know, generally. And uh, most scenes that you look at, you don't look at the edge where the sky meets that. You're looking at the people, the water, and what have you. Now I'm going to move down into the tropical waters of Florida. And this picture, it's kind of blue, but I like the green. I like to sort of bring in some of that green. So I'm going to take some uh, blue with some of this yellow, only adding a little bit of white to it. Um, I didn't put it on the palette, but sometimes I'll use phthalo blue. The phthalo blue is one of those specialty colors that really lights up the tropical waters. So you get a very luminescent blue. And if you add cadmium yellow light to that, you'll get a very luminescent uh, phthalo green from that. And that makes it a, a nice, nice color. So now I thin this green out with some water because I want this green to be in the, in the lower shallow waters, which is usually more of a green. In this area here, some of this green. Brush has too much bristle with it, so I'm going to go back to the that softer bristle brush and get rid of some of those strokes. And... Sorry that I went over the figure because I could paint over that later on. Leaving some of the white of the paper where I want to put the crest of the waves in. So I want the green to be in the shallow areas. Oh, I can get over here. I wanted to, I could be in what I have. You know, sometimes in my studio, I'll pin a piece of canvas to the wall where I have this latitude that I can go out further if I wanted to. I can always get a stretcher at a different size and build my scene out, you know? So later on, I want to make this more of a panorama and more of a, I, I have the ability to do that rather than having a stretched canvas that's already locked in. If you work from the just the canvas itself, you can always get stretches. They sell them within a half inch of each other. So you can get them any size and make your canvas and then just order the frame. Like here, I'll just sort of just show that you know you can go out on that area. Now I'm just gonna add a little bit in it on the waves with some white, but I want to put a little bit of the blue in the white so it's not pure white. My second layer, I'll make it a little brighter. So like here on these waves here, they're not pure white because you can see the white down here, but there there's sort of a little bit of a blue tinge to them. So I'm gonna come in this area here and just let me go in here too. I'm gonna get some of this white. In this area, you see 
this white foam in here and it sort of forms these little patterns where you'll see like little, it looks like a net. So if I show you some of that, I'm gonna put the, the, the crest of the wave right here where it's sinking into the ground. Right now it doesn't show up good because I didn't do the, the sand yet. Later on, I'll come back on that. But I wanna put some of this in this with the, I have these little, I don't, I'm not going to see them that clearly as you go down. So they all meld together when you get a little further down on the distance. You know, it just looks like one color. You remember this wave that was before this one? It sank into the sand. So it, it's going to reflect the sky. It's going to reflect the sky. So I'm going to come back on that yellow. You'll notice on my palette, there's my mixing area. And I kept my colors pretty much intact. So it, they're not you know, uh, fouled up where I have to put new color down. So now I'm gonna take some of this yellow again. And usually the reflection in the water is usually a little more saturated than what it's reflecting. If you look at ponds and things like that, uh, you'll tend to observe that. So here, I'm just gonna, I have a little red on a brush that I picked up somewhere. If I was working in watercolor, that would be a little bit of a problem to deal with, you know, but with acrylic, my next layer, I can go over it. You know? Well, I've got this color here. I might even just put a couple of strokes of that same color to uniform reflect the sky a little bit. I'm coming in here too. Just used to have an expression called dance your colors around, you know? The beauty about painting is you have the license to do that, you know? You, you are in control. Okay. Now, I want to get something like a pink sand. So how do we mix pink, red and white? So I'm gonna take some of this, I'll take some of this cool cool red, the alizarin crimson over here, add some white to it. Can you hold the uh, palette up a little bit? Yeah, let me just okay. see. If I... Okay. The alizarin crimson and, or it's a cadmium red medium. And I'm adding white to it. So I have this red, pink, you know, I'm gonna add a little more white and a little yellow to it. So I'm gonna add a little more yellow to it. I wanna tone it down a little bit. It's almost getting to be like a flesh color, you know, like it's, and then add more white to it. I want it to be. And the last color I wanna to add to it is some blue. All right, if I add blue to that, you can start to get almost like, um, I'm gonna, again, I'm not gonna add it to the middle of the color, I'm gonna add it to the edge of the color so you can see what it looks like, see like that? So I don't know if you can see that on camera. We, I can see it so that everyone else should be able to see yeah. it. So that, that blue winds up toning down the sand like, the trick is, you can see by adding blue, here's what you get, there's what you had. If you cover the whole thing, you forget what it is you had. So work from the edges till you get what you want. And then, I want it to be like right, right here. Uh, I want to get a little darker on the sand that's near the water. So in this area, I want to get a little darker. why I'm using the uh, blow into the uh, pink. And I'm going to 
We'll make this just a little thicker over here. And then I'm gonna come back with a wider brush and add some more white to it. You know, for those of us who've been painting a long time, one of the big dilemmas is what the hell do we do with all of these paintings, you know, if they're not all sold? So you're trying to manage them and that's a, you know, pretty much a, a nightmare. You know, how do you care for them? You wind up at some point either donating them or giving them away. And hopefully you're giving them away to people that appreciate them, that hold on to them, that know the story of them. Uh, and I know many of you have that same issue and say, what do we do? Uh, I'm working with uh, Debbie Coles DeBay and Rick Ballou and a couple of other artists like in a think tank to say, how can we do? Number one is to secure your artwork, make sure it doesn't get destroyed or destroyed. Get it uh, uh, archived where you know the names, titles, sizes, and everything else. And then look at who's going to handle it when you're gone, you know, who's going to take the responsibility of trying to keep it intact or donate it to wherever it's going to do the most good. You figure how much time we spent painting these and what they mean to us individually. They're little stories of our lives uh, that are pieced apart. Sometimes I say, is it all worth it? Maybe I just want to sit back on a chair and not do so much work and just watch the world go by and sip my martini, you know. But most of us as artists, we just can't do that. We just got to keep on creating more and more and more. <laughs> we don't stop. Yeah. In fact, uh, with Phyllis Emmett, who's in the, the watercolor, uh, uh, Palm Beach Watercolor Society, she's got lots of paintings now. And her daughter is almost in a dilemma now. What do I do with them all? How do I do? So we're trying to get them sold at the Weissman Center. So hopefully someday we're going to have an open house and we're ready. And we're going to just try and um, find homes for her paintings and anything that we can make on it. We'll make a donation to the Palm Beach Watercolor so Society as well as uh, the Weissman Center, which does a lot of good for people. So here now, I'm adding that lighter paint for the sand which usually as you go up the hill, gets lighter. Many of you have been into Fire Island in, in New York, uh, in Long Island. The sand up on the hills away from the water is white hot, you know. In fact, if you walk with your bare feet, <laughs> you burn them. It, it's painful. <laughs> you can come on one side of the beach. So here now I'm in this. And again, I'm random stroking the tank just covering some ground and my objective is not to make each one the same like the one i just showed you that we did the other day you know as a demo and my students is to make this one a little different so that we have a series of them that we can i mean the great thing with this is it's my photograph that i used so I know when I took it, where it was and what happened, I have the license to use that as a model. And now I can modify that. And I'm just gonna take some water and just spread that first layer around. And I don't have to go in any one direction. If you look at some of the master's works, you know, whether it's the impressionists or what have you, You'll notice that their brush strokes go all over the place. Some are thick, some are thin. But when you look at a painting finally, when the painting is finally finished, it should look good from 20 feet away, which draws you in so that you recognize the composition is clear as to what it is, drives you in. And then when you look at it from two or three feet away, it's even interesting again because now you're seeing the texture you're seeing the patterns you're seeing things that you didn't see at the end and you're not looking for a lot of detail but you're looking for things that the viewer if you have it subtly outlined the viewer will uh, mix into the painting they'll see people that they know in the figures rather than a figure that you painted so clearly that they can't imagine someone else in there here I'm just doing a little bit of a soft line between that uh, wet sand 
and the dry sand. And now I also want to go very light here with some, you know, broad colors in here. Again, I'm using as big a brush as I can get away with in covering that ground. Particularly in the foreground, I want to get, and I'll, I'll even go down a little lower and I might want to make this painting a little bigger. I have the latitude that I can stand out here. Last thing here on my first layer is the figures. I'm going to uh, now, and here we got a, a light sky, so it easily silhouettes the people. And you notice in my photograph, the, the people are almost silhouetted. You see a little bit of her blonde hair here, and maybe a little bit of color on the edge of her dress, but most of it is just silhouetted figures. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to mix some purple, ultramarine, blue, and red. And you see that? I got that color right away. Make, I want to make enough where I can do all the figures. There's a red violet. If I add more blue to that, I get a blue violet. And I want a blue violet, so I'm adding more blue to it. Okay, but if you wanted to make that black, the color that you would add would be the complement of the purple, the complement of blue violet. And that would be a yellow. Now, you would think that the yellow would make this lighter. It wouldn't be a silhouette anymore. But if I add yellow to that color, and I'm going to move it to the edge here. I added yellow, and then I start to extend it out. I'm going to add a little more blue to that. And you see how dark that gets? I can actually, if I keep on playing with that, with the ultramarine, the yellow, and the red, I can almost make that figure totally silhouetted. So let's just see what it looks like here. I like to exaggerate the colors. In, in painting, uh, you, you, it's good to do that because your camera doesn't pick up some colors, you know? So you can exaggerate where the shadows uh, have a blue tone to it or a purple tone to it rather than black or grays. Dress to sort of, here's the child. I want the child to be looking up in a moment. You know. The hand coming down like that, the other hand joining. So there's a dress here. You get the leg. You get, I'm not fussing over it, you know, I'm just. I'm going to take a foot there in this one. The child's uh, suit is down lower than her dress, so I'm going to bring that down a little more like that. And then just a little feet silhouette like that. Uh, it, it should be, this feet should be higher than her feet, so I might have to just, you know, increase her change of foot for me. So there's two figures. Let me go down with, with this other figure that's in the foreground here. And then I'm gonna just sort of I want to lighten the other ones up a little bit. I'm going to add a little white to it to thin them down so that it's not so uh, intense. Because the further things go away, the lighter they get in the distance. They're not as uh, dark. So I can make these figures, maybe they're a hundred, you know, a hundred feet away. Just suggesting. With making that fishing pole, I would not make it a solid line straight. Break the line so that the line doesn't attract the eye too much. So I would maybe have the, the line come up above the horizon line like that, and then leave a little space and then pick up the rod there. And that's even too strong. 
But then I'll put these other figures in down here, way down on the beach. You know? Your figures float until you put the shadows in. They sort of just float up and down off the eye. So I'm going to add some shadow. And that's just good enough. We said the sun would be so roughly there. So I want the, that sun. And I'm trying to make it a, a red violet because the sand is a pink. The trick here too now, before I do the other figures, the edges of the shadows would be sharper close to the, the person, but as it goes out, they would uh, you know, get fuzzy. So like out here, you don't want a solid line, you want a soft line out here. So just put some water with that. Uh, the, the lines here will be a little sharper right up by the, by the figure, you know, and then they would get softer and then these out here, I'm just going to suggest just the sun is here. I'm just going to have that shadow go out this way. This shadow here going out that way. And they're long shadows because the sun is down near the horizon. And you'll notice that this figure here, if the sun is there, I'm going to go down to the foot and just cast that shadow this way. And the other foot like that. The dress here might be starting somewhere around here. Now, again, this is all the first layer. And I just want to blur this a little bit, get rid of some of those lines that are in there. I want to have a little shadow of that foam that's on the beach. Like right where that wave broke, you see the shadows of the, of the, uh, the foam? It's usually right under the wave. Put that in with a little bit of a purple. Just as a subtle shadow. Okay. And not do a continuous line, you know, but just, just enough to say, oh, wow getting a little bit of a shadow. And when it's not that far, you don't see it anymore, you know? You might have another wave, this wave here that's breaking here, that might be having a little bit of a shadow on it. Let's just say I completed the first layer. Um, oh, I don't like all of this. If it's a lot of line work, your eye goes right to the line work rather than Paying attention to the figure. So sometimes on the second and third layers, that's what I'm refining, you know, is the Ralph, everybody is loving this. And I don't know if you realize it's 8 30. It's 8 30. Well, give me two more minutes. You <laughs> can have five more minutes. I'm okay. Oh, okay. People, you know, most of the people are still watching you. Oh, great. That's great. I want to go back over that sun and okay. just see that sun right up. This has been amazing. Thank you. Seeing it up close, it's a little more interesting than what I can see on the camera. And I might add, I'll first look again now after my first layer and say, is there anything I'd want to take out that's getting in the way? I don't really see. I like the spacing of the people. Uh, I might have a dog in here at some point, you know, and maybe if, 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 if I had a painting of my dog or my son's dog, we had a Great Dane for a number of years, uh, a, a Harlequin Great Dane. And I remember very well when we used to take her down to Fire Island on the beach and uh, she didn't like the ocean. She was a little nervous about that. <laughs> you remember, Greg? But I would almost like to make this very personal and put that great thing, that Harlequin great thing, right in here somewhere sitting. And then, and then that painting, would, this painting would have even more meaning to me. Wow. 
you know, we should be painting as artists the paintings that mean very much to us. Like I tell all my students, I says, no one can be in your brain as, as good as you. You can see out from your eyes, your life experience is unique. You should be painting the things that you know best. It's like a writer, a writer's first book is usually autobiography. So an artist should be painting scenes from their life. And if you wanna start off, find a black and white photo of your great grandfather or your parents or my father, my grandfather, I think we only have six or seven pictures of him. And we have maybe 20 pictures of my father. And I like to take them and I knew my father, but I never met my grandfather. But if I painted my grandfather, my 100 years from now, my great, great grandson would look back on that painting and say, my great grandfather painted this painting of his great, his grandfather who he never met. This painting is a treasure to me. So nobody else painting that scene would it have that much meaning. So here again, I'll go back to the thing that the treasure that we leave to the next people is what we saw and witnessed that we left for the next generations. So I try to do that in all my paintings to make them very personal and good, bad, or indifferent as to whether my life was good, bad, or what I liked or what have you. I like to leave the visual reference to those things. So, I'm even going to put that really do that white there. You see how bright that second layer would come on the white, you know? And I can spruce up on some of those waves. And I could use a smaller brush and what have you. Um, oh, just to, uh, with a small brush now, I might, on the edge of this figure, capture some of that light that. I'm going to capture that sunlight and she's wearing a red dress here. All right. So let's just see if I have a little red, a little red on her shoulder right there, which is just that enough light on the edge. And then I want to do just her hair. I want to give it a little bit of a yellow, with the yellow sky, I'd like to give that just that little bit of a yellow. Just that. Just the tie in the sky, that reflection, yellow on her hair. And then not to overdo it, I wouldn't do that person in that, but this similar one. Uh, last thing, I'll put a couple of footprints in the sand just by going with that dark uh, violet in the pink. And just maybe. maybe down here, we might have some. Give it some texture. And finally, no scene would be good without a couple of birds. And being that they would be silhouetted. And where would I put them? I want, I want to put them in a place that's going to be good. I don't want to put them right over any figure. Well, uh, usually, things in threes are usually nice. Uh, let's say over here. So we might just do that. What questions do you have? <laughs> okay, I, I think you probably answered most of the questions. What I'm getting from everybody is that it's been wonderful, inspiring, they loved it. They said art and philosophy and that you're a terrific teacher. That's the, if anyone has a question, they can unmute and ask it now. I Again, this isn't a finished one. I had, I'd usually have two more layers to go that would uh, get it more. I like the soft edges. I like the colors. I like this is a softer version of the other one. I wanted to know what kind of, what size brushes you were using, Ralph. Okay. You know, generally, depending on the size of the canvas that I'm working on, uh, I'll use a, uh, anywhere between 
four, six, eight, and tens. Uh, like on this one, I'm you. I used a brush that's this size, you know, to cover ground, and I used a, a flat brush that you know you would normally use for gesso or something like that, which would be this size. So on that size canvas, this is not too a uh, smaller brush or a bigger brush. If I'm doing the figures, I'll use maybe one that's half this size or one fourth of this size. But the flat brushes are wonderful and they're very versatile uh, because you can use a, the narrow side to make smaller brush strokes and then on an angle to make wider brush strokes. And again, that tip that I gave you of putting the brush down on the canvas and dragging your arm, you have much more control of your brush and with a lot less strokes. That Thank was a good you. question. I have a question. Why did you choose yellow for your sky color? Uh, you know, I, I choose the yellow because I wanted to silhouette the purple, the purple and the yellow being complements. It simplified the figures for me and it, more of the morning light, particularly down here in the south when you when you catch you know, the early morning light right after the early part of the day. And if you really look at that light on the days that you get that yellow, after the sun, the, the brilliant oranges and what have you disappear, as you raise your eye level up, you'll start to see it turn into pale uh, green and blue as it gets wow. higher in the sky. Wow. And so also, different than New York. Yeah, it, it also makes for an unusual painting. You know, typically, if you make your skies blue all the time, it gets to be commonplace, you know? Yeah. This was so informative. Thank you so much, Ralph. Oh, you're welcome. I thank you all for joining in. I I, I don't I don't get a chance to <laughs> to philosophize, but I do feel art and philosophy go well together. And much of what you do in art is the same philosophy of life of why we're here.